So here's an example of, uh, of a diagram in the banking mm, application. So here we have actually a hierarchy of objects, uh, which uh, in itself, this particular class diagram, as you know, uh, in UML, uh, uh, the minimum requirement for a class uh, to be present on the diagram, uh, to be a valid diagram of a class, is just the name. Uh, we, in this particular class in CIS 123, uh, want to use also the section that shows the attributes and methods so that we can learn uh, uh, you know, more about how we work with classes. But overall, you can just use uh, names. So, for instance, here we say that uh, ultimately what the application is going to be using is the checking account, the savings account, stock and bond. Stock and bonds are considered to be securities, right? And in the classical design, uh, both, uh, both of these checking account and saving account and, and the securities are assets to, uh, you know, on the somewhere on the balance sheet uh, for that particular business. At the same time, uh, a bank could also own a real estate, right? So there's a real estate and uh, bank accounts and real estate are insurable, right? So you can actually buy insurance for those things. And that's why there's something else in there. So, uh, you know, considering all these possibilities, again, when you want to use these classes in your software, there should be some, some, some thinking um, into the, the process of how do we create these objects. Once they're created and once they all, they're all exist and know about each other, it's a, it's a good thing. Then we can start using them. But how do you bring them up? How do you create them is yet another challenge. So again, this constructor business that we're trying to talk about in this particular section sometimes can be extremely simple when you deal with individual classes, but sometimes it can be tricky when more than one class is inv involved in, in, in uh, creating the structure. Uh, but the bottom line is, initialize uh, all data attributes if they're present in your class there must be initialized with appropriate values. N none of these, um, you know, thinking that, uh, okay, in my class, this set of attributes is really important, and the set of some other attributes is not so important, is really a, a bad idea, you know, bad, bad approach. You really need to consider all data attributes to be very important, and from the very early stage of object life cycle, uh, those, uh, the data needs to be initialized. And of course, constructor is the place where, where the, the, the work needs to be done. Uh, so uh, you should uh, keep your objects in good state, we said that. Uh, now, to properly initialize base classes in the hierarchical model of objects, uh, we also need to uh, work with constructors. We covered that to a certain extent in the uh, previous week and, and, and before when we showed how a constructor could call a super, super class a constructor using a super keyword. So there was a, a talk about that, and we have uh, videos about that. Uh, uh, sometimes you need to allocate dynamic memory, right, uh, for resources. For example, if you want to have a class that represents a picture, a JPEG or, you know, PNG format or any other, uh, sometimes um, uh, initialization of your uh, class uh, instance would require you to create, create a class then open a file with that picture, determine the size of that picture, and maybe reserve some memory so that you have memory so that where you can, for instance, load that image into memory and then begin manipulating it. Even more of that type of work would be uh, occurring uh, when you process, say, a video file, right? So, for example, you could have uh, software that chops you know, splits video file, uh, large video files into more manageable individual parts. In that case, clearly, again, you may work with some dynamic memory so that you load 
chunks of that video and then save it as in, um, you know, individual files. A and in that case, again, uh, some dynamic memory manipulation is needed. Uh, overall, what is dynamic memory manipulation? Is that when at design time, we don't know how much memory we need, right? We do find that at runtime. When someone tells us, open this file, then we can look at that file, determine its size, and say, OK, that's how much, much memory we may need. So uh, that is uh, an example of dynamic memory uh, uh, use and, and also resources. Uh, when I say resource, anytime you want to access a device or a file or a network connection, uh, you're actually claiming some resources from the system. Because, uh, for example, when you open a file, uh, an operating system you know, keeps track of, of files being used by the software, and there is a table of open files uh, somewhere in the memory that belongs to the operating system. And in that case, uh, when you open a file, you're actually taking away uh, the slot, the record from the table. And it's possible to open so many files on the system that the table would become, uh, will become exhausted and you will no longer be able to open any more files. On modern operating systems, this is um, a uh, somewhat difficult proposition, but it's possible to, to hit that, 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 that level. So anyway, um, resources needs to be managed carefully, and memory also needs to be managed carefully. And therefore, uh, we mention it here. And again, constructor is oftentimes a very important place for dynamic memory management. Well, you write uh, your code in C or C++, you also have to worry about uh, deallocating resources. And uh, as constructors in C++, they have destructors, uh, which are responsible oftentimes uh, are best places to deallocate uh, previously dynamically allocated resources. In Java, uh, you don't have to worry about it because the uh, uh, Java uh, garbage collector will pick uh, um, uh, objects that are no longer used and return their memory back to the system. All right. Um, uh, when you have your objects, um, uh, every object is considered to be an artifact of the system and uh, it can be unit of maintenance, right? Uh, the <coughs> important uh, benefit of object-oriented design is that uh, you know when you have to make some changes, fix problems, or perhaps mm, uh, alternate the way things were uh, originally designed. Uh, then um, I when you have individual classes, they become units of maintenance, unit, uh, units of documentation, so that you capture the information about the system based on the classes that you have. And also, very importantly, a unit of testing, which means that in a, uh, in a good um, uh, software development cycle, typically for each class, you write a small program which performs a unit testing of an individual class and also unit test programs that uh, that uh, test uh, combinations of classes if they if they if they're used together uh, as a component of the system so uh, could such unit be reused in future designs uh, yes the the short answer is yes and you can read some of these bullets <coughs> regarding uh, uh, regarding this uh, but uh, mm, uh, overall uh, the possibility to reuse an existing class. For instance, uh, say we design a specific date and time class, and it does particular financial calculations, so you know, participates in particular financial calculations. Is there a high possibility of re reusing that class in your next project? Very much so, I think, especially if you stay with the same company and that's what that's the business that they, they perform, then uh, the possibility of reasons that is very, very uh, high. 
descriptive names, uh, we mentioned this in our Java class, but also uh, here, mm, uh, what I would say that naming consistency is very important. Industry, industry wide, oftentimes there are conventions on how to name variables, how to name classes, how to name uh, constants, and so forth. Uh, and, uh, uh, but also, sometimes you join a company and they have a, their own uh, tweaks and turns in the way they use names, and you probably want to be consistent with that. It's part of the culture which you're trying to join and mix in and blend in, and so uh, be consistent how you name your variables is very important. It is also very, very important. Uh, not to use bad variable names, such as single character names, um, questionable <laughs> abbreviations and acronyms, um, and also like chopped words uh, that are difficult to reproduce or even remember tomorrow. Uh, what, uh, what did you do to name your variables yesterday? Is that's something that needs to, uh, needs to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, banned uh, uh, from, from, from your work. Um, and you should, you know, try not to do.